again, and then before we get into the message, which is from James, I would like to share just a brief other point with you. So would you join me for a moment as we pray again? Father, as we gather, as we worship you, may you be with us as we look at your word. May you bless us, Father, as we seek to see something more of you. May you lead us as your spirit does to know something of your glory and greatness. We thank you for the freedoms we enjoy. We thank you, Father, for this holiday season. In the name of Jesus, amen. So before we get into James, I would like you to look with me, and it's not up on the board, or not up on the wall, but John 10, 22 says, Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Now some of you are probably wondering, how do we get to the feast of dedication from James? Well, let me share with you, for those who are not aware, sunrise tonight, Hanukkah starts. That is the Feast of Dedication. Jesus observed the Feast of Dedication. He went to the temple during this time. Now, the Feast of Dedication or the Feast of Lights or Hanukkah, whichever name you would like to use, is a celebration for Jews remembering the retaking of the temple and the lighting of the oil in the candle or in the menorah almost said candelabra. That would get me in the wrong spot, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> um, when the temple was taken over by Antiochus Epiph Epiphanes, he desecrated the temple. So the Jews, in order to prepare it for worship again, had to dedicate it. Well, it takes time to get the oil. It takes time to, to pray to get the temple ready to be used again. They had enough oil to last for one day. Miraculously, according to the stories, the oil lasted for eight days instead of just one. That gives us the Feast of Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. So beginning tonight, for those of you that have not gotten all your Christmas shopping done, let me throw some more at you. Now you've got to buy Hanukkah gifts for people too. And that's one gift a day, every day, for the entire time of Hanukkah. Just leave them in front of my door, it's fine. <laughs> no, just, just wanted to share that with you so that you knew a little bit about what's going on. Um, it is a very important feast, and as I said, Jesus himself attended it. So... Now we're on to James. This morning, James is going to share some words for those who are rich. Those who have more than they need and have gotten some of their wealth by hurting others. James does not condemn being rich, but the way they use what they have. There are many people who use their wealth for God. And he will continue to bless those people. But those who misuse God's blessing will be held accountable for that sin. As I was studying, I read this little thing, and I'll just share this with you. Um, according to one author, anybody who makes more than $18,000 a year is in the top 4% of the wealthiest people in the world. To give you an idea of the wealth that God has blessed our nation with, of the way God has guided this nation and helped this nation and its people to prosper, $18,000 puts us in the top 4%. That's quite an interesting number because here, $18,000 qualifies you at 100% poverty level. 
God is blessing, and God has blessed this nation. Going back to where we were last week. So James chapter 5, 1 through 6. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last day. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury, You have fatted your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Okay. Interesting words. And you're thinking, he's going to base a sermon on criticizing everybody in this room who makes more than $18,000. No, not actually. Just thought I'd share that with you. This This is not an attack on anyone who uses their blessings for glorifying God. James begins by challenging the rich to weep and to howl because of what is coming to them. And there must have been some people in the church James is working in who used their riches unwisely. The wording, according to A.T. Robertson in his word study books, are words that reflect bursting into weeping with grief. Riches that are hoarded will fail the people that hoard them. They will never bring complete satisfaction. And there are three points made here in verses 2 and 3. First, your wealth and riches are corrupted. Your clothes or garments are moth-eaten. And your gold and your silver are corrupted. Things that are not used will rot away. The best car, if left unattended, will deteriorate. Anybody who's ever left a car parked for years understands you just don't go out and start it up and have it work real well for you. First of all, gas doesn't stay that well for that long of a period of time. Seals dry out. Things happen when things are left to rot. Things do not usually improve with the sitting or the misuse. If we are blessed, it is something that is to be used. I'd like to read from 1 Timothy 6 and 7, 6 verse 7 here, where it says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. You can't, I mean, in all honesty, there's very little you can actually pack inside a casket. I was watching this video the other day of a gentleman who actually, and I can't tell you where it was at, but it was something famous, where he had his favorite car, and he was actually buried in his car. Now, I don't know how many cemetery plots you have to buy to bury a luxury car, but um, that's a lot of money just sitting underneath the dirt. You know, it's not doing him any good right now. I'm fairly certain There are very, very few cars in heaven. Now, the Bible does speak of the disciples being in all all in one accord, but I don't, that was while they were here on earth, not in heaven. Okay. (laughs) Twelve of them in an accord is not comfortable, no. There is a point in time where having luxuries, having these fancy things will not do us any good. And the very last part of verse 3 
stands to condemn those who hoard things. The very corrosion, the lack of use for things God has given us will stand as a witness against us. People will notice what we do with what we have. People will understand if we hoard, if we've got riches and it's not being used. Now, again, we go back to where we were a few weeks ago. It is not wrong to plan for the future. It is not wrong to have a savings account. It is not wrong to have a retirement account. But if your faith lies in that rather than the God who provided it for you, guess what? It's sin. We are to live with him in mind and knowing that he is the giver of all. To hoard while others are in need is wrong. To keep back what God has blessed us when we can be a blessing to someone else is wrong. God notices, and so do people. Many, and this scripture in James refers to this, many are obsessed with obtaining more and more and more. And they will do so even going to illegal lengths to get it. Look at 1 Timothy 6 again, but 9 and 10. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I have great doubts when we get to heaven Jesus is ever going to ask any of us, so how much money did you leave in the bank when you left? I don't think that's going to come out of his mouth. But there is a possibility he may wonder and thank you for the way you used your money to bless others. Do you remember I told a story years ago of a Scottish minister who went to heaven and he was met at the gates and he was asked why he should be admitted into heaven. And this is a dream that he had, okay? He didn't come back and tell us this. This is a dream that he had. But he expounded on all the great sermons that he had given and the great churches that he had preached in. And he was told, well, we didn't hear any of those up here and we didn't see any of that. So he told of the great works that he did helping people and that didn't get him anywhere. And he turned around to leave and he was very depressed. And Peter says, but wait a minute. Were you the one who fed the sparrows? He said, well, yeah, I fed sparrows. He said, well, come on in. The father of the sparrows wants to thank you. See, Sometimes we can get tied up with doing great things. And sometimes we can get so excited to do things that people notice. But God notices everything, including something, something as simple as praying with someone when they need it, of being there with someone when they just need a touch on their arm that says that you understand. God sees what we do. And God knows where our hearts are at and what our minds go to. Now, as we look at the last few verses of this, four through six, it may seem strange to many of us. We would never think about not paying someone that is owed them. Yet, in many times, it happens. And in Scripture, it has happened. And God specifically condemns those who refuse to pay workers and laborers. In our day, there are contracts and agreements that we all sign like crazy. 
You ever, Gav, you ever, ever notice the contracts you sign on the cell phone? I mean, there are pages and pages and pages and pages. Any of you read all of that? Uh, I'm going to tell you, I signed at the bottom. I figure it's, it's pretty simple. If I make the payments, I have a phone. If I don't make the payments, I don't have a phone. I figure it boils down to that. But there are so many things that we do nowadays to make sure that people get what they're paid. You know, you go to the bank for a loan. Um, okay, they're like 12, 14 pages. And you're saying, okay, you just killed a tree for me to borrow enough money to plant a tree. We do that because people occasionally are untrustworthy and they don't pay the debts that they owe. God says we are responsible for our debts and for the way we treat those that work for us. In the time of Scripture, most people worked for a handshake, if even that. And God says it is wrong for the rich to take advantage of the poor. And I've got a whole list of scriptures we're going to go over now. Beginning in Proverbs 21, verse 6. Getting treasures by a lying tongue is the fleeting fantasy of those who seek death. Okay? That by itself should tell us we're not supposed to lie in the way we get money. Proverbs 22, 16. He who oppresses the poor to increase his riches and he who gives to the rich will surely come to poverty. 27, 24. For riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. Or Jeremiah 22, 13. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice, who uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work. God speaks of dishonest prophet in Ezekiel 22, 13. Behold, therefore, I beat my fist at the dishonest prophet which you have made and at the bloodshed which has been in your midst. Amos 8 4 through 7, speaks of the fact that God will not forget the dishonest works of the rich. Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail, saying, When will the new moon be passed that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath that we may trade wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of your works. And one more verse I'd like to bring up on this. Micah 3, five. And I will come near you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Does anybody want God turning their, his face against them? God is promising that to all of those We need to be generous people. God has not changed. And what was a sin years ago is still a sin today. To place money before people is a sin. To place money before God is a sin. Many of us have lived a long time. We know the value of people of life, and God values life, and God values people. Life 
born and unborn is important to God. We must, and I mean this seriously, we must be a people who stand for life. God doesn't give us an option on this one. God doesn't ever say in his scriptures, some life, some life is good, some life is not. Now, there were wicked people that God destroyed, but you know what? That's God's choice. That's not ours. And God doesn't say we get to make that choice. God knows best, and he knows way more than we do. That was almost an amen. God knows more than we do. God knows the lives that are coming into this world. And it's his choice that there's life. And we shouldn't be taking it. And when I say we, I'm not, I'm not trying to refer to anybody in here. But this country, this world as a general, does not value life. We're not standing for it in a wide sense. And we're not standing for the God who says that life is so important. Getting back to the sermon here, to repeat 1 Timothy 6.10, the beginning of that verse. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. There is, again, nothing wrong with having money. But do you love it? Or are you using it the way God has blessed you? Luke 9.23, the words of Jesus here. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him de deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. There's only one worth following. The one who can give us greater than we can even imagine. And the one who has promised that for those that follow him. You know, this could be one of those depressing sermons if you're one of the rich that make over 18000 a year. <laughs> this could be depressing. But it's not. Because we know the one who blesses. Because our hearts are with the one who provides and gives to us. We know God. We know Jesus. We're led by the Holy Spirit. The three in one is there. And when he is in the right spot in our lives, then however much we have is enough. When he is in the right spot, then what we have doesn't so much become ours that becomes what he can use. And this does not apply just to money. We saw a video in Sunday school today, and we spoke about how we can serve God the way that we can be there when people need us. You know, when someone needs a hand, it's important to be there for them. It's nice if people need something and we can provide a need. That's, that's wonderful. But sometimes the way God reaches people is through his own people. So this isn't just about money. You can hoard your time and never give it to anyone else. You can be selfish with what you do with yourself and not be there for other people. God sees and God knows. And for those of us who know the God of creation, the true God of this world, we should be sharing ourselves 
our money, our time, our thoughts, our hearts, whatever it is that this world needs, we should be there for people. Because God does use us all the time. Sometimes more than once a day. We're closing singing a song that says, we understand that. The closing song is called, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. As we sing this song, if you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then I invite you to accept Him. And if, I, if you do know Him, then I invite you to serve Him today and forever. All stand, please. 296, 1 and 3. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt His tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide, heavenly peace, divinest comfort, and his heaven him to dwell. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whatever befall me. Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothed in mortal, Wings his flight to realms of day. This my song through endless ages. Jesus would be all the way. This my song through endless ages. Jesus would be all the way. Would you join me as we close in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you again for who you are, for the ability to serve you. Father, we know you've gifted each of us with the ability to do some things. Bless us as we do those things. Bless us, Father, as we pray for each other. Bless us as we serve you. Give us wisdom that comes from you. In the name of Jesus. Amen.